So we continue our reading in the, um, the Bhagavad Gita as, as in the spirit of an uh, introduction to bhakti. And last time, we talked about more about fools. And we talked about, in verse 9, uh, 11, we talked about the arguments about what makes a fool a fool. And the arguments that fools make about Krishna, against the idea that Krishna has a personality, that uh, Krishna has a personality of, of Godhead. And in the last verse, then, in the, that we took last time, 9, 12, we talked about these different kinds of expectations that the fools have. And just to remind you, there were three kinds of expectations. There were vain hopes, vain actions, and vain knowledge. So the vain hopes was the hopes that are held by those who do not see Krishna as um, a spiritual being. They don't see the spiritual energy of Krishna. They don't see Radharani in Krishna. So sorry. they... Ah, Madhuri Rasa, sorry. you want to translate? Radhe, Radhe, sorry. No Thank problem. you. Mm. Thank you. Sorry. So the people with um, with no hope, they just act in terms of result. They do their spiritual actions in the hope that they will be a concrete thing that they, they can receive when they're done. And there's nothing that goes beyond the material, concrete thing that they receive. There's no transcendental experience. There's no hope. The second kind was <clears throat> vain action. And that's about karma. It's about uh, it's karma yoga. It's, it's the idea that uh, if we only do the right steps, only do the right acts, then we will be led to realization without any consideration for the spiritual depth of Krishna. This is also an empty or vain uh, action. And then the third kind we talked about last time was. Uh, vain knowledge. Those who do not see Krishna as having a loving personality, from our point of view, who do not see Radharani's loving energy inside Krishna, they don't see Krishna as Radha Mohan, they will also be deluded. They will not also not find the path. And once again, for all three cases, we said it before many times now, it's not about being fool, it's not about being wrong only. It's about being, it's about thinking wrongly, about being under, misguided in the way we understand the world. We work wrongly, we learn wrongly, we live wrongly, and worst of all, or most important, we love wrongly. We don't love spiritually. We don't love in terms of the heart and divine soul of the one we love. We love in terms of the thing. We see the beautiful hand of our lover. We see the beautiful voice. We hear the beautiful voice of our lover, and we think that is everything. But of course, this is just not the, this is the outward expression of something more divine. And it's only by understanding the divinity of of love that we can find our path to to another one. So this word understanding comes back again and again in Prabhupada's commentary. And what he most often means by understanding is seeing the divinity in things. 
seeing the divinity in actions, seeing the divinity in knowledge, and seeing the divinity in 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 the hope for the for the future. And all these things must be lived. They cannot be frozen. They cannot be just frozen action or frozen knowledge or frozen hope. They must be lived and evolved and felt in order to have um, the, this understanding of, of Krishna that Prabhupada is trying to tell us about. So understanding for Prabhupada is not intellectual understanding. It's understanding with the heart which for us in the West is a very strange kind of understanding, a very difficult kind of understanding, because we go to school and we learn the facts, we learn the figures, we learn the clear things that we can buy and sell, Amazon style, as Gurudev says. But we don't have an understanding, we don't learn how to understand with our hearts. So when we come to Bhakti, when we come to our Gurudev, we're learning to think with our hearts. It's not thinking, of course. It's We're learning to experience the world through our hearts and not through our, through our intellects. And this is where we essentially left things last time with, um, with verse uh, number 12. So now we can move on, if you please, with um, <clears throat> verse 13 says the following, O son of Prita, those who are not deluded, the great souls, the Mahatma, are under protection of the divine nature. They are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, original and inexhaustible. It's a very, very strong verse. It says a lot of things. Let's try to look at it. In one way, the verse answers the question, what does it mean to understand in Prabhupada's sense of the word? What does it mean to understand that Krishna is eternal and knowledge and bliss, like we talked about last time? What is this spiritual understanding? Well, he says, the verse says that only by Bhakti, only through Bhakti, can we find this understanding. The verse says, they are fully engaged in devotional service, in Bhakti. So those who can see me, those who are great souls, those are the ones who are <coughs> engaged in Bhakti. Finding the understanding requires the surrender to devotional service. So there's no way out of just understanding Krishna as a <clears throat> absolute power than by surrendering to the emotional experience of Krishna as, as a soul, as a heart, as a loving entity driven by the energy of love, by the energy of Radharani. The verse has two parts, it's two sentences really. The one says something about how devotees are externally. He says, well, those are the ones who are not deluded, those are the ones who are under the protection of, of nature. But then it also says something about devotees in the second sentence, about how they are internally, in their hearts. It says they are fully engaged in devotional service. And they are engaged because they know me as a loving, a loving soul. There's an external part of the verse and an internal part of the verse. The way devotees see Krishna externally 
and the way the devotees see Krishna internally. And they're quite different. They're quite different. So then Prabhupada comments, <clears throat> in this verse, the description of Mahatma is given, a great soul. Huh? Any great soul is a soul who is engaged in devotional service, who knows Krishna personally, knows the heart and soul of Krishna. And I haven't checked this, but I read in a commentary that this is the last time that Prabhupada uses the word Mahatma in his commentary of Bhagavad Gita. He continues, the first sign of the Mahatma is that he is already situated in the divine nature. So you can, you can tell a Mahatma because he or she already has a relation of loving devotion to the divine. And through that relation of loving devotion, that devotee is part of the divine. Re loving devotion is the expression of the divine in each one of us. And so when there's a real relation of love, it's because that the divine is already present and expressing itself in the devotee. So Prabhupada says that the devotee is already situated, the great soul, the Mahatma, is already situated in the divine nature. This is what lets he or she speak and understand what's going on there. Prabhupada, Prabhupada continues, he is not under the control of material nature. And how is this affected? He asks Prabhupada. That is explained in the seventh chapter. And in the seventh chapter, Prabhupada said, one who surrenders unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead Shri Krishna at once becomes freed from the control of material nature. That is the qualification. So we often talk about qualification in our discussions amongst devotees. What is it? What do I need to have? What do I need to know? What do I need to be able to do? How many locks do I need to chant? How late at night can I stay up memorizing uh, Shastra? And all the rest. But the only qualification is to have surrendered, to let go of the material reality, reality. As we said last time, it's not a matter of fighting to get into the spiritual world. It's a matter of letting go of the material world that, is, that we're clinging to. So once one can be free from the control of material nature, Prabhupada says, as soon as he surrenders his soul to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that is the preliminary formula. Everything starts with surrender. And all of us are here because to one uh, level or another, we have surrendered. Some of us have surrendered a little bit. Some of us have surrendered more. And some of us have surrendered immensely. We're all on the same path, even if some of us are on different different places on that, on that path. And Prabhupada continues in the commentary now of verse 13. Being marginal potency, as soon as the living entity is freed from the control of material nature, he is put under the guidance of spiritual nature. So you remember there are three levels of potency, three main levels. There are many levels, but the three main levels, we have the, the internal, which is the spiritual transcendental level, the external, which is the material level, and the marginal, which is where, which is where human devotees are living. We're living somewhere between material nature and spiritual reality. All of us. All of us has a little glimpse of what spiritual reality looks like. All of us has a hint. All of us has a suspicion of what might be there. And this is the key to us 
surrendering. It's a key to us moving ahead. Nobody is a stone. Nobody is completely without a soul. Nobody is completely without a spirit. Everyone is, is in this marginal position. So everyone essentially has this qualification. It's a matter of surrendering to that, the spiritual side of our marginal potency, reduce, reducing our dependency on the material nature, and moving towards our spiritual nature. We possess both. Every single one of us, every jiva possesses both. Prabhupada continues, the, the guidance of the spiritual nature is called diving prakritam, divine nature. So, when one is promoted in that way, by surrendering mm, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one attains to the stage of Great Soul. Mahatma. Once again, we all have this divine nature in us. The difference between jivas is the degree of surrender. It's not the degree of divinity. We all have that. It's the degree to which we are able to let go of them of the material side of our personalities. Prabhupada goes on. The Mahatma, the great soul, does not divert his attention to anything outside Krishna because he knows perfectly well that Krishna is the original supreme person, the cause of all causes. There is no doubt about it. So here, Prabhupada talks about attention, and what he's referring to is the one-pointed focus that our dear Gurudev talks about so, so very often, that the Mahatma has exactly this focus, this attention, only on the Radha Mohan, and anything outside of the Radha Mohan is uninteresting, because it takes us away from the cause of all causes. The great soul is completely um, committed, completely one-pointed. And then the Prabhupada continues, such a Mahatma, or great soul, develops through association with other Mahatma, pure devotees. Here comes the other dimension we know so well in our practice, association. How important it is for us to be associated with other souls who are on the same path. And the great soul, the Mahatma, is associated with, with other great souls, other Mahatma, or what Prabhupada calls pure devotees. And Prabhupada continues then, he says, pure devotees are not even attracted by Krishna's other features, such as the four-armed Mahavishnu. So these external, visual, material characteristics of Krishna for the pure devotees are uninteresting. What is the pure devotee mm, interested in? It's the spiritual character of Krishna, the personality of Krishna, the inner life of Krishna, because that inner life mirrors the inner life of the pure devotee. And that's why, and Prabhupada continues now, they are simply attracted by the two-armed form of Krishna, since they are not attracted to other features of Krishna, and not to speak of demigods either, they are not concerned with any form of demigod or of human being. So all of Krishna's material forms, his expansions and his, and his avatars in the material world, these are uninteresting for pure devotees. 
They may be very interesting for impure devotees, and they also may help impure, impure devotees to find the way to purifying themselves. But for pure devotees, they are not interesting. Pure devotees, Prabhupada says, they only meditate upon Krishna, in Krishna consciousness. They are always engaged in the unswerving, so complete focus, service of, of the Lord in Krishna consciousness. The Krishna consciousness for Prabhupada, certainly in the 1960s and 70s, when he was teaching, was exactly what we mean by one-pointedness. Our mind and completely focused on the spiritual nature of, of God. And this focus, Prabhupada mentions in the last line there, is a kind of service. Just to focus on, just to focus on Prabhupada, sorry, on, on Krishna's spiritual nature, on his transcendental nature, is already a kind of service. Because when we're focused on the transcendental nature of Krishna, of Radha Mohan, then everything we do in our lives is service. Every little thing from brushing our teeth, to putting on our socks, to driving the car, to cleaning the dishes, to walking the dog, all of these things, when we're focused on Krishna, are pure uh, devotee service. We move on then to verse 14. which starts to talk about the effort we must make in order to obtain this experience of pure devotional well, service. You are amazing. You know, we are sitting here with 20 devotees and we are melting away. <laughs> Just to let you know, who they were sitting there. Jai Ho. Just to give you a little feedback of our feeling. I can see some beautiful faces there, yes. That's quite nice. <laughs> so this first 14 talks about the struggle a bit, which we all know about, we ordinary devotees. Verse 14 says, it says, always chanting my glories, endeavoring with great determination, bowing down before me, these great souls perpetually worship me with devotion. Now there's so much going on here in this verse, so many beautiful things that I want to slow down a little bit on it. Um, first of all, the, the Sanskrit line is satatam kirtyanyamam, so always chanting to me, basically. I mean, I'm not a very good translator, but always chanting to me. What does this satatam mean, this always? It means that no matter where, no matter when, day and night, sleeping and waking, in work, in the kitchen, in rest, at night, at day, we're always chanting the glories. Always chanting the glories. But we don't do it for, what's the word, fruitative ends. We don't do it because we want to get somewhere with it. We do it as an egolessness gesture. We chant for nothing and everything. We chant for the sake of chanting. Chanting is, chanting is, it's a union with Radha Mohan. It doesn't produce anything. It brings us together. 
It brings us together with Krishna. It's the yoga. It's the yog. It's the, the, the original term yog, which means union. It's the yog with Radha Mohan. We chant this endless statam, this endless, continuous, everywhere, always feeling of unity with Radha Mohan. And we do it. What brings us there? What gives us the energy? What gives us the, the willpower to do that? What gives us that desire? That is the presence of Radharani's energy in our hearts. The energy, the loving energy that is, is there from the start, if only we cultivate it. So we chant for no reason. We chant for the beauty of chanting. We chant to be close to Radha Mohan, to be in this union with uh, Radha Mohan. And we do it. And here's another really beautiful Sanskrit word that I discovered. Namasya Santash, we do it out of humbleness. Namasya means humbleness or respectfulness. But if you unpack this word a little bit, it's even more beautiful because na, of course, means not. And ma means me or the ego me. Or So when we do namashya, we're doing not meanness. We're doing not me-ness. We're practicing the not me. We're letting go of our material ego in nama, that's our material ego, the not me. And we're letting our spiritual, our spiritual identity unfold, our svarupa unfold. So this is wonderful, wonderful, and maya, of course, you have in the word ma, the ego, maya, the material reality. So nama, namasya, is the practice of letting that material ego go. And we do it permanently. We do it continuously when we're in our when, when we're in our bhajan. We do it in order to establish this union with Radha Mohan. We're always seeking the union with Radha Mohan. So the expression in the Sanskrit text is Nitya Yukta Upasate. So Nitya is uh, permanent. Yukta is yoga, yog, so the union, and upasata, devotional or longing. So we have this permanent, constant desire to be in unity, to be together, to be together with Radha Mohan, yes. But the way we live that out in our spiritual lives, in our everyday lives, the spiritual part of our everyday lives, is through association, by this permanent longing to be together with other souls, who are thinking similarly, like all you beautiful souls sitting there in the cellar in the Munger Mandir, I see. So it's our, our strongest emotion of relation, of association, is that to God, but we, we're able to live it out through our association with, with other devotees, which is why association is so, so very important for us in our practice. So it's this kind of inner natural drive. It's not the same as greed, as loba, but it's an international, inter, internal longing that we have to be together. Because we want to, wanting to be together with you, you, my dear brothers and sisters, is a way of wanting to be together with Radha Mohan. I can live it out on a small scale by, by being together with you and doing bhajan with you and talking with you and and, and showing my care for you and my love for you, but it's a, it's a little mini universe of my massive love and wanting to be in yoga with Radha Mohan. So this idea of yoga, yug, or yukta in Sanskrit, in this verse, is the key. It's this idea of union. Union is what we seek. We want to be there together. We want to be uh, unified, united in loving exchange. And that's what yoga means. That's what yog it means. All union is loving. You cannot, you cannot have a relationship with any other human being or even animal without some little bit of love. But when we turn up the volume on that love, then we raise ourselves to a, to a higher, higher 
spiritual level. And we do this, according to this verse at least, by doing kirtan, satatam kirtayan tomam, by always doing kirtan to me, the verse says. But what is kirtan? You know the word kirtan means kirta, kirta means glory. So kirtan is singing glory, spreading the fame of God, chanting the glory of, of God, chanting the wonder of God, and by doing that, becoming close to it in, in our own hearts. So to go back there, too, there are two levels in the verse, the, this external level and an internal level. On the external level, yes, we do all the, the bhajan. We do all the material rituals. We do all the respect. We give all our respects. We chant. We pray. We bow. We worship. We clean. We do the, uh, we do the puja. We do all the things that are um, required of us formally, externally. But those very same external practices we as devotees do them internally. We do them with devotion. We do them from our hearts. We do them with love. We do it with, with spirit. So every, every stick of incense I light at the altar, I'm not just putting a flame to the wood of the stick. I'm pushing my soul into the fire pushing my soul into the smoke of the incense and feeling it go into my heart as a spiritual experience. This is what devotional practice is. It's not flying around in the clouds. It's material life which is given to spiritual practice. Material life is not evil. It's the place from which we can do spiritual practice. If we weren't material beings, we couldn't devote ourselves. We couldn't be there to serve Gurudev, to help him feel comfortable, to help him feel healthy and stay healthy and, and keep doing his bhajan. It's because we were material beings that we can have spiritual practice. So this great determination that's in the, in the verse, the verse said, I'll repeat it, um, always chanting my glories, endeavoring with great determination, it says. This determination is our material determination that we do because we're in material bodies and we have to, we have to try, we have to exert ourselves, we have to express our spiritual sides through our material existence. We have to fight to rise above our material bodies and to resist the material constraints. We do this with our hearts and minds. We do it with that little part and parcel of Radha Mohan that's in us. We feel that, we express it. We feel that, we give it to Gurudev. We feel that, we give it to Radha Mohan. This is what bhajan is. It's making beautiful poetry and song with our voices, with our pens, with our hearts, with our eyes and doing it as purely as we can. Done only with Radha Mohan in mind, but done with the instruments that we have in our material bodies. So every time you hear song in the temple, which I miss so dearly, you're so fortunate, you know you are. Think of the harmony, think of that. Sound is material. Songs are material. And it's the place between the, 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 the divine in your hearts and the divine in another one. Then Prabhupada goes on <clears throat> with a very strange metaphor. He says, the Mahatma, the great soul, cannot be manufactured by rubber stamping. 
an ordinary man. And I suppose you all know what rubber stamping means. It means you make a copy of something on a, on a piece of rubber and you put some ink on there and you stamp it on a paper and then you've made the same thing, or maybe not. <clears throat> Today, um, you would probably say copier coli, as we say here, it's uh, copy and paste on your computer. So you take a copy of a human being and you put it in another place. This is not what a Mahatma does. I probably don't need to explain to you why. It's kind of an amusing metaphor. Because the rubber stamp, the copy and paste, the photocopy of a human being can only capture the external features, only the external shape, maybe a bit of the external color, but obviously cannot capture the internal, the internal life, the spiritual life of the jiva. So no one can become a Mahatma by cop copying externally the identity of another Mahatma. Even though this is our tendency, we see a, a great Mahatma on the street, we see in Vrindavan, we see them all the time, they're all over the place, we see a sadhu and and then we put on the same clothes and walk in the same way and carry the same food bucket and go to the same places and all the external things. And this does not make us a great soul, is what Prabhupada is saying. What we need to become a great soul is to, is to live the same internal experience as, as Mahatma. And in a certain way, we cannot copy that at all because every jiva is different. Every single jiva in all of the universe is individual and unique and has an individual unique soul. And that soul, of course, as you know, lives forever and cannot be copied and pasted, cannot be rubber stamped. So our task in becoming a Mahatma is to only, only, I say, our task in becoming a Mahatma is to cultivate that inner unique soul, that inner divine personality that we have, just like Krishna as, is a divine personality. Then Prabhupada goes on, he says, his symptoms, that is the Mahatma, but of course there are her symptoms too, because we have many women Mahatma. The symptoms are described here. A Mahatma is always engaged in chanting the glories of the Supreme Lord Krishna, the Personality of Godhead. He, the Mahatma, has no other business. He was always engaged in the glorification of the Lord. In other words, he is not an, imperson an impersonalist. So the Mahatma is not a rubber stamp. The Mahatma has an internal relationship to Krishna, an internal relationship to Radha Mohan. And what does that mean? Again, I try to repeat it because I want you so to believe it. The internal relation you have to Radha Mohan is a reflection of Radha Mohan inside you. It's that part and parcel of Radha Mohan that is already inside you, which only needs to be cultivated, brought out made bigger. So that personal relationship between your soul and the soul of Radha Mohan is obviously one of love, fed by the energy of Radharani. Radharani's energy is the, is the magnetic field between you and Radha Mohan, between us and Radha Mohan. Where there is a loving relation, between any beings, there is Radharani, because she is the energy of loving relations. And where there is a personal relationship with Krishna, between you and, and Radha Mohan, Krishna Mohan, and Krishna, Radha Krishna, or with anyone, there is Radharani. If you feel anything in your heart 
towards your brothers and sisters sitting beside you, towards your mother or your father or to your Gurudev, it's because there's Radha, Radha Rani's energy is flowing through your, through your body. So Prabhupada goes on, when the question of glorification is there, because he just said we need to glorify Krishna, when the question of glorification is there, one has to glorify the Supreme Lord. Praising His holy name is eternal form. His eternal form. His transcendental qualities and his uncommon pastimes. One has to glorify all these things, Prabhupada says. Therefore, a Mahatma is attached to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So three things to glorify when we're having our relationship with Radha Mohan. Eternal form, the permanent form. Oh there, my little friends. The one is the eternal form, the second is the transcendental qualities, and the third is the uncommon, uncommon pastimes. When we glorify the eternal form, what does that mean? That means we focus on the transcendental soul identity of Radha Mohan. We see the Svarup of, of uh, Radha Mohan. We see it in some sense. As ordinary devotees, we see it in a limited way, in half-blind as we are. And our Gurudev will see it much more clearly and will help us to find our way to, to see it better. But we know it's there. We suspect it's there. We see a little bit in the darkness. Remember the, remember the citation from... First Corinthians that that Gurudev likes so much that when I was a child I could see clearly, now I see through a glass darkly. Because as we grow older, we see more darkly that eternal form of, of Radha Mohan. But we do see it. We see it a little bit, and that's why we're here together. We see it through our devotion. We see it through our loving eyes. We see it through the help, with the help of Radha Rani and the loving energy that she provides to us. We see it in our brothers and sisters. We see it in the eyes of our grandfather and our grandmother. We see it in the eyes of the bus driver. We see the eternal form of Radha Mohan everywhere, if only a little bit. And the more we dedicate ourselves to our devotion, the more clearly we will, we will see it. In order to see it, we must stay close to the love. We must take the service of Radharani. We must take on um, the, the Manjari Bhav, the role of the servant of the goddess of love, Radharani. So Radha, Radharani, is our conduit. It's the electrical cable of love that will take us closer to the eternal form of Radha Mohan. Manjari Bhav is exactly the way that we can get there. The more we deepen that, the closer we come to the experience of divine love that Radha Radharani is, is, is holding and is transmitting, and the closer we come to the eternal form of Radha Mohan. Prabhupada continues. The Mahatma is always engaged in different activities of devotional service. As described in Srimad Bhagavatam, hearing and chanting about Vishnu, not a demigod or a human being, but as Vishnu. This is devotion, says Prabhupada. 
Svarvanam Kirtanam Vishnu, Smaranam, and remembering him. So Svaranam means hearing, Svaranam Kirtanam, so hearing, chanting, Vishnu, Vishnu, Krishna, hearing, chanting about Krishna, and Smarana, you all know this, remembering. Svaranam Kirtanam Vishnu Smaranam. Hearing, chanting Krishna, and remembering as well. And then Prabhupada says, uh, such a Mahatma has firm determination. This determination is very important. This drive, this willpower we have. Has firm determination to achieve at the ultimate end the association of the Supreme Lord in any one of the five transcendental rasas. The five rasas were, to remind you, the, um, the lowest one is um, Santarati, the liberation from the material world. The next one is Dasyarati, when we know that we're, we have souls. Sakyarati, when we're associating with Krishna as a friend. But Saliyarati, when we have a brotherly love with God, and of course the highest rasa is Madhura Rati, which is the conjugal, conjugal love of God. And Prabhupada goes on to say, to achieve that success, he engaged all activities, mental, bodily, and vocal. Everything in the service of the Supreme Lord, Shri Krishna. That is called full Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada says there are three activities. And together they make a beautiful human whole. They, 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 they envelop and they make, make use of the, the entire beauty of human beings. The first is mental. So one-pointedness, like Gurudev always reminds us, focusing the minds, focusing on our Ishtadeva, uh, putting out the noise, using all our mental powers, our minds given even in our marginal potency by God to, to be laser focused on Radha Mohan. We have a mind, we have a beautiful mind, and we can do beautiful things with it. And the one most beautiful thing we can do it with it is to focus on God. So that's our mental activity. And then our bodily activity. We also have, we also have, yeah. huh? <laughs> wonderful, 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 my dear. How you become rustic? <laughs> I don't know. He was Pandit. How you become a Sikh? Yeah. <laughs> Again, repeat this line. With the mind. Focus the mind. Um. <sighs> That there are three activities, there are three kinds of activities that we do in service of Radha Mohan. The mind and the body and the and the voice. And I just wanted to, I feel so strongly that again the importance of our material existence and the this these limited but beautiful minds that God has given us that we can use them for this service of focusing on Radha Mohan, thinking solely on that, putting all our intellectual energy 
into the thought of Radha Mohan, presence with Radha Mohan, and unity with Ishtadeva. This is the absolute beauty on earth that we can share with by using our minds. They're not useless. <coughs> They're not useless. They're a beautiful tool that we can use to serve. And we do it by focusing, one-pointed, like Gurudev says. And the second, <coughs> sorry, the second service is with our bodies. And in the same way, we were created with beautiful bodies, imperfect, imperfect, tired, aging, sometimes but essentially beautiful because we can use these bodies to serve also Radha Mohan, to serve in all different ways by doing, doing service to each other, by doing service in temple, by doing prem prashad, by, by doing singing kirtan, and by reading, and writing, and talking, and sharing, and, and teaching. We can all do these things with our body, by cleaning the, the temple, by sweeping the streets. All these beautiful things we can do with our beautiful bodies, if we do them with full consciousness of, of Radha Mohan. And then the third is the, the voice. We all have beautiful voices. <clears throat> Mine's not so beautiful, but, but um, <laughs> it's a little tired. <laughs> but we can speak and we can sing. I'm looking at uh, Suniti Didi there, the, our, our beautiful uh, singing sister. And I think that uh, there's, it's not an accident that she has uh, been given to us with this voice of hers and that she sings and she and she serves in, in, in that way, among many other ways. So we sing about the lilas, we sing our prayers, we sing, we uh, pronounce our om, we, 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 we connect to, to Radha Mohan also through the service of our, our voices. But there's more, that's already so much, <laughs> but there's more, and the more is that by using these three instruments that we have been given by the Creator, our minds, our bodies, our voices, just by doing them in the service of Radha Mohan, they become more pure. We purify ourselves. We, come, we become more mm, self-present. We become more present to Radha Mohan. We become more present to each other. We become more clear in our service. We be become more unified in our mood, in our bhav, and our emotions become much clearer. We spend so much of our lives having confused emotions. What do I want? What do I feel? What do I love? What do I hate? And through our service, I know you share this with me, we become so, our emotions become beautiful and creamy. And, and pure and strong, and, and we can do such beautiful things with them, our emotions, in service of, of Radha Mohan. And all these things are part of the path of, of, of taking on something like Manjari Bhav. This is the Bhav. Those are the three ways that we talk about. So Prabhupada continues, he never gets tired, I get tired, but uh, Prabhupada never tires, as you know, so he just keeps talking. He <laughs> says, in devotional service, there are certain activities which are called determined, such as fasting on certain days, like the 11th day of the moon, Akadashi, and on the appearance day of the Lord, etc. There are many, of course, we know this. And we can think, we can maybe think when we read this, well, this sounds so much like Vaidhi Bhakti, which is what we want to move beyond. We want to become Raganugas and Rupanugas, don't we? Because these things, fasting and doing our duties and our ritual duties in the temple, they seem like they're mechanical. We do them at the same time, we do them in the same way, we sing the same verses, 
They seem like ritual and mechanical. But wait a minute. Let's remember. The actions in Vaidhi Bhakti become Raganuga Bhakti or Rupa Nuga Bhakti by the investment of our hearts in them. We have to have the yeah. form, we have to have the form of the ritual to concentrate our hearts, put our love into these actions, put our love into the verses, into the rituals at temple, into the cleaning, into the day by day things and that's how we rise and purify vaidhi bhakti becomes raganuga bhakti rupa nuga bhakti rupa nuga bhakti depends on vaidhi bhakti for its form but then it's filled with love and becomes something much much greater so it's been by the power of our devotion our love in doing our mechanical rituals that they become blossoming flowers. So, so externally, they look like Vaidhi Bhakti, but internally, when we, are, when we are determined, when we are when we are sincere in our devotion, they become Rupa Nuga Bhakti. And there's a, so internally, there's a huge difference for us. We must do our external duties. But when we give them internal love, loving devotion, they become transcendental. Prabhupada goes on, all these rules and regulations are offered by the great acharyas for those who are actually interested in getting admission into the association of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the transcendental world. And so we might ask, what does he mean by offered? All these rules and regulations are offered by the great Acharyas. That means that these Vaidhi Bhakti uh, actions are given to us as a possibility to become Raganuga, Rupanuga, Bhakta. These forms are given to us. So are the, the prayers we use in temple, the rituals we carry out in temple are very, very, very old. They come to us from many, many generations and on, down through the parampara. But they come to us as a choice. They come to us as a beautiful possibility. We can take them and fill them with our love, fill them in our devotion. And then they will become a place where we can purify and transcend in our spiritual development. They're given to us as a gift. They're offered as a gift, all these rituals. We take them and we fill them with our love and they become, become something greater. And then we offer them to the next generation. Yeah. Prabhupada continues, the Mahatmas, <clears throat> Great souls strictly observe all these rules and regulations. And therefore, they are sure to achieve the desired results. Well, we do that too, don't we? We are very loyal and faithful to the, the rules and regulations. We respect all the etiquette of bhakti, but we do it by, by investing our hearts into it, by investing the love of our souls into it. And that's how we find our way. That's how we find our way to another more. Prabhupada says, as described in the second verse of this chapter, this devotional service is not only easy, but it can be performed in a happy mood. This is a very interesting thing, I find. That it's all so easy. It's all like a walk in the garden. But he says more about this. Let's look. He says... Prabhupada says, one does not need to undergo any severe penance or austerity. He can live this life in devotional service, guided by an expert spiritual master, and in any position, either as a householder 
or a sannyasi, or a brahmachari, in any position and in anywhere in the world, he can perform this devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and thus become actually Mahatma, a great soul. Anybody, listen to this, anybody. Like so many of you, I grew up in a Christian tradition where being pious or being a good devotee meant it was difficult. If it was pleasurable, then you were doing something wrong. If it was, <laughs> then you were doing something wrong. But one beautiful lesson of Gurudev from through many years, I remember it, is this that it will come naturally to you. When you're on the place, right place in the path, it will come naturally to you. If you cannot do the ritual, don't do the ritual. If you cannot chant, don't chant. When the, when the time is right for, the, for your uh, spiritual advancement, you will find the place on the path that belongs to you. And it will be like breathing oxygen, breathing air, as easy as that. It will be as natural as it can be. And why? The other lesson, great lesson of Gurudev, why is it easy? Because this is our natural position. Verse 18, this is, this is our constitutional position. This is where we belong. This is our home. This is where we started, and this is where we're going. It's the most natural thing that we can imagine. It's the most authentic way to be. This very last verse, you know how Gurudev loves of Bhagavad Gita. Well, we already talked about it weeks ago. It said, this place is where we belong. So we just need to slide into it. Likely we would slide into the arms of our, our mother. This is where we belong. This is where we're most at home. This is where we are most um, comfortable. So no effort needed. We just have to be ourselves, which is saying a lot, which is not easy to find the way to that. But once we find that way, then all is easy. Ah. That's the end of the commentary for verse 14. Maybe it's a good time to let you take the floor. Do you want to share or Gurudev want to add or Jananda Maharaj or others? Um. Thank you so much. I appreciate from the bottom of my heart that you show us such an, a natural way to integrate our, our love and our devotional service into our daily life activities. So there isn't perhaps by my conscious a distinction, but not in my doing. So I'm there, then I'm always there. I don't have to, to go in a groove somewhere else or to an ashram or <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there. I can be there with my heart. And then I, I'm in connection and I can connect. It is, you can feel it when, when someone is there. There, there, there starts happening something else. It's like an overtone. What's in how it's called in like a flow, like a flow. <laughs> I appreciate it so much, so intensely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So please, thanks to David. Thanks. So very beautifully described the, this Bhagavad Gita. And uh, interesting, so our, so we may do Bhagavad Bhakti, but if our heart, our mind got one pointed, 
with love, then that Bhaiti Bhakti also can go Raganuga Bhakti and also、uh, Rupanuga Bhakti. This is very beautifully explained, Uttaba、uh, Maharaj, Uttaba Ji. <laughs> and、uh, this also, last sentence. Devotional, devotional service, bhakti is easy. Why easy? This is constitutional position, very natural. And、uh, so, so, this beautifully explained 18 chapter、uh, 78. Maybe read for us.、Uh, But, <laughs> yes. So this is.、Oh. So I try to read.、Uh, the living entity in his original position is a pure spirit.、Mm -hmm. He is just like an atomic article of the Supreme Spirit.、Mm -hmm. The conditioned living entity, however, is a marginal energy of the Lord. He tends to be in contact with both the material energy and the spiritual energy. In other words, The living entity is situated between the two energies of the Lord. And because he belongs to the superior energy of the Lord, he has a particle of independence. By proper use of that independence, He becomes under the direct order of Krishna. Thus, he attains his normal condition in the pleasure giving potency.、Yeah. So, that was the experience. <laughs> Beautiful. Would you like to say something to this class? Feel to listen this time. Um, honestly, uh, being here in Vrindavan for uh the past three days and having just this word keeps on coming again and again, just. Flowing floods, floods of love, flooding of of mercy. Every every moment, every day. And even to hear again today that just by pointing your mind, your feelings, your heart, all that you are, all that you have. Unto our Savior, unto Krishna Radharani. And to do that together with all of the, the little、uh, souls around you, whether they are so close you can touch them, or so far you can see them over Zoom on video. It's. So empowering. And it's just so amazing. <laughs> honestly, is the word that comes to mind. Just amazing. No, no, no. <laughs> And I hear amazing is a, a pretty fun word here. <laughs> so I'm going to use it. <laughs> And I just want to say、uh, personally, thank you. You know, continue to, for sharing everything that you you feel, everyone, for 
showing up in all of these classes, for showing your faces, for even not showing your faces, just connecting, just being there, just showing that you have this desire, this yearning to, to be normal, to be natural, <laughs> whatever that is, <laughs> as you've explained. And sharing that love that is in within all of us, because that is what we are, mm. and that is what we are to do. And that is what I feel from what everyone, including yourself, has taught mm. uh, us. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. So this is Darshan Baya, and this is Darshan in the age of Zoom. We see and we feel. <laughs> okay. Avi is from Colombia. Yes, I'm from Colombia. Um, I don't speak English, but... <laughs> 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 I don't speak English, but I try to say something. Mm. I'm very lucky and very, how do you say in English, afortunado? Fortunate. 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 Very fortunate for be here with this beautiful person, these beautiful feelings. And I try every day and um, open more my heart, but every time feeling more and try to enter in, in this flow. Um, and this is amazing. <laughs> 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 it's Mahatma Baya who brought this word to Guru Dev, isn't it? Amazing. Yeah. Mahatma. <laughs> Uh, there are the Maidandava two devotees who is present here and two doji who is so kindly so much efforts put in to explain Bhagavad Gita. I'm just uh, sorry, I I not I received not so much because of situation in my mind. <laughs> but what I understood ahankara means then soul thinking I'm a doer. But actually, as uh, Tegunas is doing, and then so trying to, uh, how to say, make decision for which so not qualified. It is not natural position for so. How to understand what is correct, what is correct? Uh, if I see is it my goal, then I can understand what is correct, what is not correct. But then soul is covered by my no clear vision of uh, the goal. And uh, how long I can see, how far I can see, this means it's uh, about this um, Mahatmas, they surrender to the personality of God. Even Mahatmas, they not decided what is good for me, what not good for me. <laughs> they just serving, telling, uh, they always are uh, under protection of uh, divine potency and is doing service. <laughs> but I am thinking, I must decide <laughs> what is better, go here or go away. <laughs> In my mind so much busy to <laughs> decide what I could not decide. <laughs> And I'm suffering from this and thinking, what's a stupid situation? It's not my it's not my business to do this. It's what happened me, with me when I hear this. Sorry, I not received so much because it's going on. It's purification. <laughs> yeah, purification. Rade, rade. Rade, rade. 
I'm here with Shama Priya. Ah. Radha. <laughs> thank you again for your lovely sharing. You are making all of us to go in, in flow. And to deeply, deeply understand Bhagavad Gita from perception of Radha Dasi from that mood and that feeling. Thank you, Veya. Now I, I want to announce that you're coming soon and we are all waiting for you. Everyone is waiting for you. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, 17 October, I book. Yeah. Yugala, we see you also there, so you also have to tell when you are coming. <laughs> She's sorry. Lovely. No, sometime. 18 October. <laughs> Lovely. Please. Yes, Hurry up. Hurry up. All, all fixed, Gurudev. All booked, ready to go. Okay. Yeah. Yugala, you have to also come. So you have to come. Yeah, I'll mm -hmm. run. Yugala, uh, also. <laughs> when I am coming, Gurudev. <laughs> She's a naughty journalist. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. So sweet and Thank you. Yeah, I hope. Rade, Rade. Everybody. Rade, Rade. Rade, Rade, my dears, I'm flowing away from this class. I'm so stupid and I cannot think anything, but my tears go out and I want to say, I want to say so much deeply, I cannot find the words, but it is so, so important to be here with all you together. It's, it's, I, I cannot say with words how important it is for me to hear these words and be in this feeling yeah. and this love. Thank you so much. Radha da, Dashyam is given by Suniti. Yeah. And this mercy of everyone who comes to join that. This is the mercy of all. This is the great move of sadhus who attend these classes and who like to share their bhatmas because they are so enlightened. Like mm. whole life is problem, right? Whole life is reading books, <laughs> but now he can include his. Uh, education, studies in one direction or in one flow of his realization and giving and sharing so sweetly that I'm surprised. Surprised. What he do at first only come to Vrindavan and by the mercy of Vrindavan, all he realizes. So, my dear, 
is a very fortunate days when I come to Vrindavan mm. to go deep to understand and realize something. 